So as you all know, um, concrete is fantastic material, uh, high strength and so on, but uh, if exposed to very harsh environments, uh, concrete can also deteriorate. And you can see here that uh, different exposure conditions, harsh exposure conditions, uh, can cause deterioration of concrete, spalling uh, due to freeze-thaw attack, uh, cracking due to alkali-silica reaction or alkali aggregate reaction. Uh, you can observe uh, mechanical abrasion uh, and acid attack if acid uh, attacks the concrete. But uh, these uh, uh, direct uh, deterioration mechanisms are uh, often combined with uh, indirect um, deterioration mechanisms uh, which are caused by uh, depassivating agents, chlorides or uh, carbonation. Uh, which cause uh, corrosion in uh, the concrete, embedded, uh, the embedded steel can corrode, and for that reason uh, you can also observe cracking and spalling due to this indirect attack uh, via uh, the reinforcement corrosion. In order to, let's say, specify concrete, structural concrete, you have to know some information about the concrete, uh, the condition of the concrete, <laughs> Uh, still from the beginning, uh, during planning, but also uh, the condition achieved after construction and the condition uh, which will, let's say, decrease uh, over time uh, during service. So these are a lot of question marks and uh, my talk is about uh, how can we answer these uh, very important questions. What is the reliability of your structural concrete in these harsh environments uh, over time? So if your condition is decreasing, of course, the duration is increasing. And for that, uh, if, if we uh, concentrate on, on reinforcement corrosion, so this is an attack caused by chlorides or by, by uh, depassivation of, of, of the concrete uh, and the depassivation of, of reinforcement steel, um, you will get, oh, sorry. You will get, uh, oops. There we are. You will get um, depassivation first and caused, uh, this cause uh, reinforcement corrosion and due to the, uh, let's say, uh, expansive uh, deterioration of, of the reinforcing steel because uh, steel rust is uh, more, uh, gets more volume, you will get corrosion-induced cracking. Uh, followed by, by spalling, and uh, if the confine, confinement is uh, uh, not available anymore, you get also bond failure and uh, maybe collapse due to the loss of steel cross-section. So, uh, you see there are some, some parallels to the load-bearing capacity and the design of structures uh, in structural design. Um, Often in structural design, you classify your concrete uh, according uh, its strength, and then uh, you are looking for loads, what is uh, uh, present here, and if you have uh, the material resistance and uh, uh, the, the load stress, you can calculate your geometry, in this uh, case, uh, the dimension of a column, for example. And the same approach is applied uh, to concrete, uh, which is affected by, by harsh environments. Uh, you have uh, um, resistance, in, in this case, carbonation resistance of the concrete. Uh, you have to classify the environmental load, um, comparable to the load you have in load-bearing capacity uh, comparisons. And from that, you know the resistance and the environmental load you can calculate your geometry, which is here, the concrete cover. So this is the idea of design for durability, in this case, corrosion. And concentrating on carbonation or carbonation-induced corrosion in Europe, uh, you have a different uh, classification of exposure classes. So uh, you have, uh, uh, exp um, sorry, you have uh, classes like this, uh, exposure carbonation class one, 
which is uh, linked to a dry or permanently wet environment. And here you can uh, find some, some examples on that. And uh, XC2, which is uh, wet, rarely dry. Uh, and uh, the, the harshest class is XC4, cyclic wet and dry. Uh, concrete surfaces subject, subject to water contact uh, are here uh, examples for, for, that time, uh, for that type of, of exposure class. Coming uh, from uh, these exposure uh, classification, in Europe you have uh, a lot of descriptive rules how to tackle this. Uh, you can see here different uh, countries, uh, Spain, Portugal, UK, Netherlands, Germany, Denmark and Norway. And as you can see here, there are some requirements concerning the water binder ratio and the minimum concrete cover. And as you can see here, uh, the deemed to satisfy rules of uh, selected uh, European countries are slightly different, although the environmental uh, condition is comparable. So you see the diversity of these different rules. But not only concrete cover and uh, water binder ratio restrictions are uh, laid down in this uh, kind of uh, deemed to satisfy design, also the type of binder. Uh, you have uh, here some information about the country and the deemed to satisfy rules permitted types of cement for the different countries. So you see there are also a lot of differences between European countries here. But not only water cement ratio, uh, minimum concrete cover uh, and cement type, also the curing is different in uh, Europe. You can see here for the different exposure classes, requirements on curing classes and uh, linked to this uh, curing durations. So that was the reason why we and uh, especially FIB, Fédération Internationale de Buton, uh, did some reliability uh, benchmark calculations based on the descriptive deemed to satisfy rules um, given in the European codes. So the situation was, beside varying descriptive rules, also close regional proximity is given, for example, Germany, uh, Denmark and Netherlands, close together, uh, the carbonation may vary independence of location and concrete receipt or concrete composition um, by taking different uh, water binder ratio cement types used for construction. And uh, the idea was to calculate the reliability you can achieve if you respect the European uh, codes. So we did this uh, uh, with uh, the help of uh, the uh, FIB model code for service life design issued in 2006. I was technical secretary of, of this committee. And we compared um, the depth of depassivation front, full probabilistic, with the concrete cover, which is also a stochastic variable. And uh, there's some, some probability that your depassivation front is uh, uh, deeper penetrated than the cover, concrete cover, and this uh, cause uh, failure. Uh, in, in terms of uh, there is some probability that carbonation uh, can occur. And we calculated that, taking out uh, the models uh, given in the model code. This is uh, the carbonation model. We slightly revised it for the uh, calculations uh, we did in order to make it more easy. Uh, we skipped the so-called uh, inverse carbonation resistance and translated it into a carbonation rate, which is much more easier to, to calculate than the uh, carbonation resistance, inverse of the carbonation resistance. In addition to that, you have some sub-functions taking into account the uh, effect of execution, in this case, curing, the effect of environmental condition, in this uh, uh, case, it is uh, uh, relative humidity, the influence of relative humidity on the carbonation development and, uh, uh, development. and uh, finally also the influence of wetting events which can also uh, affect uh, the evolution of carbonation. So a lot of data have to be collected and uh, uh, the question was uh, how to do this 
And we did it uh, like this. Um, we, uh, for the benchmark, uh, we collected all the data uh, which uh, can be linked to uh, water cement ratio, minimum cement content, uh, which will affect the carbonation rate. Uh, this is more or less the requirement on the minimum cover, which is out of the codes, uh, which was taken out of the codes. And here, the red ones, uh, these are um, parameters uh, representing the environmental condition, so relative humidity and driving rain. And what we did is uh, we calculated two situations, two design situations, uh, one favorable and one unfavorable. <coughs> favorable means we took out uh, a very uh, carbonation resistant concrete and took it in very wet environment because uh, if it is wet, uh, no carbonation, at least slow carbonation will occur. This is favorable, and the unfavorable situation, we took out uh, a, a city or location in Germany which is very dry, and linked this uh, very dry spot to a very low carbonation resistance. In this uh, aspect, we had uh, maximum water cement ratio 0.6, this is 0.6. And uh, this is a favorable, very carbonation resistant uh, uh, concrete, which is a SEM1 uh, OPC. And the second one, uh, which is uh, unfavorable, this was a SEM3B, which is a blast furnished slag cement. So Hamburg is very wet spot, and Halle, uh, as you can see here, is a very dry spot. And we combined these combinations Collected all the data which uh, is necessary to run the calculation. You see uh, there's a lot of data uh, needed. For example, the carbonation uh, resistances, uh, the relative humidity of the spots, the driving uh, rain and uh, wetness events uh, of the two cities, uh, the CO2 concentration, the cover, and of course, service life, which is 50 years in European uh, standards. From that, we calculated two reliabilities, uh, a very optimistic one, which is uh, representing Hamburg, favorable, and the pessimistic one, uh, which is represented by Halle, which is unfavorable. So this is a reliability uh, spectrum uh, you can get for XC4 in Germany at dry and wet spots if you respect the regulations of uh, this country. We did it for all the European countries, as you can see here. So these are the regulations on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you see the uh, already calculated reliabilities uh, in respect to um, depassivation of concrete, which uh, uh, is linked to reinforcement corrosion uh, subsequently. So here uh, you can find the result which was shown before. So independent uh, check was done as well. Uh, we calculated on real structures the um, reliability. We took a lot of uh, different uh, buildings, bridges. Uh, we get this data or we got this data from colleagues of FIB. So you can see here, uh, this is uh, Madrid, Spain, uh, Portugal, uh, UK, uh, Germany, uh, Norway, uh, Bergen and Oslo. Different uh, buildings, different type of binders, different water cement ratios, and we would like to know what is the reliability of these structures. So we got all the information of the structures, uh, as I've shown you in the table. We did our calculation, and later on we got real carbonation measurements, and as you can see here, predicted carbonation depths and measured are more or less comparable, and this cause that your updated reliability of your structure is more or less in line uh, as uh, predicted beforehand. So uh, one can say the models uh, just work. Here you can see the reliabilities of the di different exposure conditions uh, or exposure classes. This is a spectrum from, from 1 to 5 uh, in XC2, from minus 1 to, let's say, 2 uh, or 3 
in the case of XC3, and uh, here you can see the spectrum of XC4, uh, and the dots are the uh, real structures we also calculated. They are within this range. And now we proposed to uh, come up with a, um, yeah, uniform reliability you have to require for uh, uh, situations which are wet. In, in this situation, corrosion can occur and, and, and high corrosion rates can occur. Uh, we uh, require a reliability of 1.5. In other cases, uh, as you can see here, this is a, the threshold, uh, which is here, 85 percent, which means that in an environment drier than 85, you have no corrosion at all, no corrosion uh, rate, and therefore the consequence of depassivation is very low. And for that reason, uh, you can require only reliability of 0.5 for very dry situations and uh, classified exposures, which is XC. Three. Uh, the others, uh, XC2 is wet and uh, XC4 is wet, and therefore uh, we require a very uh, high compared to, to XC3 uh, reliability, which is 1.5. So this is the reason why we uh, differentiated the different reliabilities, because the consequences of depassivation are different. So, uh, from that, the benchmark, uh, we concluded, okay, we can do it like this. Uh, uh, in structural design, we can uh, design also for durability in a comparable manner. And uh, we did it uh, taking this formula into account. You know that formula from the table I shown you before. And uh, to make life easier, it's not a full probabilistic approach now, it is so-called uh, semi-probabilistic approach, which, uh, which is uh, taking into account so-called uh, partial safety factors. So uh, you compare design values on the left-hand side. This is a design value for the carbonation depth, and this is compared with the design value for the concrete cover, which is the minimum value. So a lot of data still is, uh, is, uh, uh, is needed. So you need some information about the partial safety factor. You need information about the material resistance. You need information about uh, the uh, influences, influencing parameters, taking into account relative humidity, uh, execution, uh, CO2 concentration, and uh, also the, the wetting events. And in doing so, uh, first of all, I would like to show how so-called partial fa safety factors have been calculated. We calculated a lot of different design situations, and we did it uh, always the same. Uh, first of all, uh, for a specific situation, carbonation uh, was calculated like this, full probabilistic. And then we uh, um, compared it with the concrete cover, with the given uh, scatter, and uh, compared it like this, that uh, if, if the concrete cover is still here, you will get with these two populations at the end of 50 years a reliability of 1.5, which was the target. So this was the first full probabilistic calculation on the carbonation depth, independency to time for a specific design situation, and then determination of cover in order to ensure a reliability of 1.5. This was done here. On the right-hand side, uh, we um, uh, transferred it into a semi-probabilistic uh, approach. We just uh, 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 introduced the safety margin. So that was the reason why this mean value is a minimum value now. And uh, the carbonation, the mean value of the carbonation was multiplied by the uh, so-called partial safety factor in such a way that the uh, design values uh, uh, are equal at that point uh, 50 years uh, of exposure. So in this case, you have to, multi uh, to multiply the, minim uh, the, the mean value of the carbonation rate by, by 1.1. So we did it for a lot of uh, design situations. As I said, here you see nine of them. And uh, what can be uh, uh, observed that the, reliable, uh, the, the partial safety factor is always uh, less than 1.25. And that is the reason that we came up with the proposal of the partial safety factor, which is 
sorry for that, which is uh, 1.25. So this was outcome of one dissertation at my institute, uh, three years uh, uh, study, a PhD study, uh, to come up with this single value. So now I would like to uh, present what's, uh, what's next. Uh, so let's start with the material resistance. In Europe, but uh, I think also in the whole world, we have a lot of different tests. Uh, here you can see four of them uh, to European regulations, but also uh, uh, international ISO, uh, you can uh, follow up this list by a Swiss code, British standard, uh, and so on, Sweden, and finally also Portugal, Netherlands, and once again, uh, test method described in GBT uh, 5082. So there's a variety of, of different, uh, let's say, test methods you can, you can apply. We applied uh, the European uh, standard, which is 12390, uh, natural carbonation, which is uh, most uh, direct and, and uh, uh, practice reflecting test. And uh, this is described here, how to do that. Uh, we tested about 150 different concrete compositions like this. Uh, we um, exposed them to natural carbonation, dry environment, and we calculated the uh, exposure. Uh, we calculated the uh, carbonation rate like this. First of all, uh, it's, it's, it's low, but then approximately uh, after 140 days of exposure, your carbonation rate becomes constant and therefore you can, you can take this value for calculation. And as you can see here, this value and the value determined after five years of exposure is very, very similar. So uh, we tested a lot of concretes and we were supported by different uh, laboratories uh, all over Europe, uh, so Finland, Norway and uh, Germany, Switzerland and so on uh, participated in this round robin test. And as you can see here, different concrete compositions, 0.4, 0.45 uh, up to 0.2 until 0.65 were tested. So in some, uh, in total, uh, 153 different exposure condition, uh, ex um, uh, concrete compositions. And uh, at the end, we tried to get some information about uh, what is really uh, decisive and as you can see here, um, water binder ratio, binder content, air content in concrete or clinker replacement uh, have been studied. And from that, only water binder ratio and clinker replacement was very decisive. So the influence of air content uh, and the influence of binder content in this region between, uh, let's say, 250 and 450 was uh, uh, not so big as for uh, water binder ratios and uh, clinker replacement, so the salmon type was very decisive. From that, we uh, grouped this information together, uh, as you can see here, and finally come up with a relationship. You see here the influence of water binder ratio, but on different levels. So to say uh, it is uh, very decisive what kind of uh, cement you are uh, using. From that, we uh, came up with a proposal uh, uh, which is classifying the concrete uh, uh, according to his uh, carbonation resistance. Uh, here you have so-called exposure resistance classes. Uh, this is a class two uh, where the carbonation rate, the mean value is two. Uh, this is a quantile. And if you uh, take a SEM1 with a water bind ratio 0.45, you will uh, get this uh, carbonation resistance. And you can see here on the table what kind of, uh, let's say, trade-off you can make. Uh, SEM3B, less carbonation resistant, you need for XRC3 with a mean carbonation rate of 3, 
0.4, uh, whereas you uh, only need 0.5 for SEM1, which is uh, much more carbonation resistant than SEM3B. So finally, to make it uh, easier for the, for the construction engineers, uh, we developed a so-called design chart. This is the input, the carbonation rate I, I showed you before. So the carbonation rate, the carbonation exposure resistance class is here given from 2 to 7. You can choose between 2 and 7. And then uh, the uh, influence of, of execution, curing time, uh, environmental action, relative humidity, time of wetting, and then uh, in dependency to the service life you require for, you can directly uh, calculate your minimum cover like this. And uh, if you are keen enough to uh, establish, let's say, standard climate for, for your country, which is uh, not so easy for a big country like Australia, but for Germany it's much more easier. You can do it like this. Uh, uh, the wet condition was described with a high relative humidity of 90%. There's no time of wetness and no probability of driving rain. Uh, this is characterizing partly saturated soil. Uh, for outdoor conditions, we have mean value 75% uh, relative humidity, but no time of wetness, no driving rain. And for XC4, uh, which is wetted, uh, same, reliable, uh, same uh, relative humidity and some, some uh, time of wetness and, and uh, probability of driving rain. So if you are able to standardize your climate, you can come up with a table uh, trade-off between carbonation, exposure resistance classes, and uh, uh, so-called minimum covers. So if you use uh, uh, concrete composition which is uh, in carbonation uh, exposure resistance class 3. You can install a very small concrete cover from 10 to 15 in the different exposure classes, but if you use uh, not so dense material, you have to increase your cover. So one example, here's a column deteriorated. You have some cracking and spalling due to carbonation. And the client said, OK, uh, there is a corrosion induced cracking and spalling visible. Uh, therefore, uh, the residual service life is zero. And you need to repair this column. And uh, uh, deviating from, from the normal uh, service life of 50 years, he wants to have a service life of only 25 years. So with this kind of design chart, you can also design for for smaller uh, service lives and longer service lives. So as you, as you know already, you need some input parameters, the carbonation rate coming out from tests or from the table, class classified table, then the cure period, relative humidity, and the time of wetness uh, multiplied by the uh, probability of driving rain and your service life. So this is uh, the result of the material test. Uh, you did some measurement on, on, on your uh, uh, repair material. It was exposed to natural carbonation after a period of 140 days. You uh, observed a, a carbonation depth of 3.4 uh, millimeters which result into a carbonation rate of 5.5. This corresponds to the exposure resistance class XC, uh, XRC6. So your material is classified. Relative humidity in uh, Munich, for example, is uh, 75%. So that was easy. Uh, the time of wetting, uh, time of wetness multiplied by the probability of driving rain. It was a north exposed uh, structure, so the column was north exposed. Uh, the time of wetness in Munich is uh, 62 days a year with a, a precipitation of, of more than 2.5 millimeters. So dividing this 62 uh, days uh, through the year, 365 days, you get a ratio of 0.5. One seven. Then the probability of driving rain for this orientation north is 3.2 percent, north and northeast 3.1 percent, and northwest 70 percent. Adding these values together, 
uh, results into a probability of driving rain for north exposed uh, um, structures of, uh, let's say, 23%. And uh, multiplying time of wetness and the uh, probability of driving rain results into a value of 0.04. Then you have all the data available. Uh, the carbonation test uh, results into 5.5. Seven days curing, 75% uh, relative humidity, time of wetness uh, multiplied by the driving rain uh, probability, 0.04. And service life was uh, requested by the client, 25 years. So you can go into the diagram like this. You will start with the uh, material uh, resistance, curing, relative humidity, time of wetness, service life, and that's the result. 15 millimeters minimum uh, concrete cover. So no, now you're uh, ready to install your concrete uh, with the tested material, and you can withstand 25 years without any depassivation, uh, or depassivation is restricted to, to a reliability of 1.5. So just to check, for 50 years, same procedure, uh, same values, but now not 25 years. 50 years, this result in the concrete cover of 22 uh, millimeters, which is less than 25, which was in the table. So this is correct. So this is a classification of concrete. Now we are coming to the assessment of structural concrete. Uh, exposed to chloride. So we did the same benchmark uh, as I showed you uh, for carbonation, also for, for chloride uh, penetration and uh, corrosion, uh, chloride-induced uh, uh, corrosion. And now we are faced with the situation, what does it mean for real structures? Uh, can we use this kind of data in order to assess the structural condition? Yes, we can. So we need some extra uh, information uh, coming from visual inspection, but we can also do some concrete cover measurements. We can add some half cell potential measurements and uh, uh, chloride profiling, and finally we can also uh, do some, some probing. Okay, this is the situation, an example. Uh, there's a concrete wall uh, structure uh, which was in service for, let's say, approximately 50 years. Uh, we did not uh, observe corrosion-induced cracks, so this structure was still in service, uh, like this. And uh, normally you will link this kind of exposure to exposure class XD3, which is uh, chloride-exposed de-icing salt. So um, for that reason it's chloride-induced uh, corrosion, which is expected. So the dimensions of this wall is 12 meters multiplied by 5 meters. And uh, we did uh, a calculation first, taking into, con into account the as-planned concrete cover and as belt concrete composition, uh, knowing the type of binder, water cement ratio, and so on, and taking into account the expected environmental load. From that calculation, it turns out, uh, taking all the formulas of the FIP model code, that your um, uh, structure member at age of uh, 47 uh, years uh, will have uh, a probability of depassivation uh, around 30 percent, which is a very high number and corresponds to reliability of 0.5. So now you can update your results uh, taking into account uh, some additional information, for example, concrete cover inspection result. Uh, First of all, we calculated this uh, probability of, of, of depassivation for the whole wall. Now you can see that the cover is different at that uh, different locations, and therefore you can also differentiate the uh, uh, corresponding um, uh, depassivation probabilities uh, here under consideration of the concrete, the measured concrete cover. So this is more or less the same. Uh, results into, let's say, uh, probability uh, of, of depassivation, but uh, uh, separately calculated for each spot represented by some uh, real concrete cover measurement. 
And uh, as the uh, concrete covers uh, are a little bigger as planned, uh, the original design moved to another design, which is, uh, let's say, giving other results. So at that time of inspection, uh, 47 years, it results into a uh, probability of, of depassivation of 0.22, 22%. But now you have a very powerful tool, half cell potential measurement. You can do it like this. Uh, there are electrodes. Uh, you do uh, electrochemical measurements like this, uh, taking real electrodes, for example, uh, into consideration. And you can plot so-called half cell potential maps like this. Here, here there's a potential difference uh, actually given according to different standards, and uh, the situation is you have an unknown defect situation like this, and you do your measurements, and this is your result, and you have to interpret this. You have two possibilities. You can uh, say, okay, there's, uh, the truth is corrosion, and you, your assessment will uh, come up with uh, uh, there is corrosion, then you are true positive. If you say there's no corrosion, but there is corrosion, this is false negative. And the second uh, mistake you can do is you say there is corrosion, but there is no corrosion. This is uh, false positive. And on the other hand, you can uh, correctly uh, interpret there is no corrosion and there is, in fact, no corrosion. So these are the possibilities. But uh, the measurement is uh, hardly influenced by different uh, factors. For example, the concrete resistivity, the anode area, the grid size is very decisive on uh, can you detect uh, corrosion, yes or no. The same applies for a crack. If the crack is uh, white, uh, so uh, to say, um, it's, it's, it's open, you can uh, detect a crack from a different distance, uh, much easier than you have a very low crack. And therefore, uh, these uh, probability of detections are heavily uh, influenced by the, uh, by the type of defect and the size of defect. <coughs> so here, this is a potential map. Uh, we measured. Uh, the question is how to interpret this. Uh, is there uh, corrosion present or not? Uh, we do it like this. Uh, here you can find a statistical paper. If you have one population, you have a straight line. But you can see here there are two uh, populations. Therefore, there is no straight line. One population is linked to the passive state and the other is linked to an active state. And uh, for that reason, you can also subdivide this in so-called uh, probability density function. This is a total uh, complete uh, list uh, and records of result. And you can divide it into a passive and an active uh, probability function. Uh, you can do it by uh, establishing a maximum likelihood method. So if you uh, run for threshold potential, means um, less than that you have active corrosion, more than that you have passive state, you can uh, 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 come to a conclusion that in this case uh, the active uh, probability function if, you, if your threshold is here, 80% is really corroding, but 20% uh, it's corroding, but you, you will not see that. On the other hand, this is a passive state. Uh, approximately 99% of your detected uh, uh, potentials will say, okay, there's nothing, uh, and you are right, uh, but only 1%, there is something, and you are wrong. So this is... Uh, uh, the, the mistake uh, of, of second order. So from that, uh, that was another PhD. Uh, you can uh, detect also the probability of detection, uh, different curves in dependency to, to the effect, uh, for example, grid size or electrolytical resistance, for example. And what you are doing here is uh, you have anode area in uh, square centimeters and you have a probability of detection. And as you can see here, if your defect is small, uh, the probability of detection is small as well. 
So as soon as your anode area is growing or is, 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 is becoming bigger, uh, then also your probability that you detect your defect is, is higher. So we did this uh, due to numerical simulation for different grid sizes. Uh, for example, you can see here, uh, five centimeters by five centimeters, you have a high uh, probability of detection where if your grid size is uh, very big, 25 multiplied by 25 centimeters, uh, you will have uh, not so good information about that. And uh, in, uh, let's say, uh, combination of these different findings, you can uh, do some beige uh, update uh, in order to give some information about is there corrosion or not by taking these formulas, uh, taking the uh, so-called probability of uh, detection curves, uh, taking uh, the depreciation probability you had before a priori, and uh, taking into account this information so that the probability of detection is very low if you have small defects and these are uh, decisive defects, then uh, uh, this results into a curve. This is original uh, depassivation front or the probability of depassivation. If you detect there's no corrosion and uh, your depassivation is like this, uh, it will decrease. So the detection uh, and uh, uh, your a priori result will decrease. But if you detect corrosion, uh, taking into account uh, this formula here, sorry for that, here, if you detect corrosion like this uh, and you have uh, a probability of uh, depassivation like this, uh, so uh, this will increase your uh, depassivation probability enormously, and therefore you will get uh, some more contrast uh, on, on that. So from that, uh, as you know, uh, we calculated uh, only taking into account information from concrete cover, a uh, probability of depassivation of 22%. Taking into account the potential mapping results, we were able to clearly identify where the regions are which are affected by corrosion, and these regions are only 7% of the whole uh, wall. And um, adding some extra uh, probing, so we, we just take this information, 7%, looked at these spots and uh, did some probing, and it turns out that uh, also the half cell potential measurement could be improved by real probing, and uh, the result was not 7%, only 3% of your reinforcement bars were tackled by a reinforcement corrosion. So it's a matter of real on-site information, taking real exposure, special variation, etc., into account in order to make your assessment of your structural concrete member, which was 3%. This is a list of, uh, uh, let's say, literature I, I have uh, taken for this presentation, and thank you very much for listening. <laughs>